gentlemen, any problems during the break? Very good. When we left off, it's the state's case. Thank you, Judge. And Judge, again, we apologize to the jury for the glitches in the last uh, presentation. It's quite all right. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll learn if you haven't already that this is what happens during trials. It's of nobody's fault whatsoever. That's, it's our fault. That's, but, but <laughs> the next witness is a does this for a living, so he acknowledged if there's any problems during his presentation, it's on him. So it's good. Fair enough. Tell us your name, please. please. Face and raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? I do. Very good. Tell us your name and spell your last name, please. My name is Grant Fredericks, spelled F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K-S. How are you employed? I'm a forensic video analyst. What does a forensic video analyst do? A uh, forensic video analyst uh, studies uh, video images, both uh, digital and analog, uh, and audio attached uh, to that to assist a trier of fact in accurately understanding issues that, uh, uh, um, that are recorded to the video systems, such as timing of images, uh, the shape, distance uh, of objects captured in images, uh, and uh, I assist uh, either a judge or jury to accurately understand that information. You could briefly summarize the training and experience you have that allows you to do what you do. Um, I have a degree in broadcast television uh, with an emphasis, emphasis on engineering uh, from Gonzaga University. I attained that uh, degree in 1982. Uh, I began working uh, in television uh, at that time. Uh, in 1984, uh, I began working uh, in uh, forensic video analysis. Uh, I joined the Vancouver Police Department in Canada. Uh, I'm a Canadian citizen and an American citizen. Uh, I ran the Forensic Video Division in Vancouver um, for a number of years, assigned to the uh, Criminal Investigation Division. Uh, at that time, I began teaching at the FBI uh, Academy uh, to other police officers in forensic video. I've been a contract instructor uh, at the FBI National Academy in Quantico uh, since uh, about 2002. I teach four primary courses a year there, uh, and I consult uh, for um, uh, <coughs> companies and uh, police agencies uh, in the use of uh, uh, in-car and body-worn video systems. Are you a certified expert in this field? Yes, I have a certification in forensic video analysis. And have you previously been qualified as an expert and testified in court as to your findings with some of these analyses you have done? Yes. Judge, at this time, I would uh, tender Mr. Fredericks as an expert. Mr. Rathis? Very good. The court will declare Grant Fredericks to be an expert in the area of forensic video analysis. Are there standards that the scientific community puts upon you in doing this job? Yes. What are those? Uh, the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence, which is a Department of Justice and FBI uh, uh, organization that establishes guidelines, uh, training requirements, uh, and standards for this work uh, sets out a series of uh, recommendations guide and guidelines for training and uh, I um, have uh, certified based on acquiring uh, those standards um, and uh, uh, I was the lead instructor for an organization called the Law Enforcement and Emergency Services Video Association uh, from about 1998 to 2012 uh, and that organization uh, teaches forensic video analysis and offers certification to both law enforcement and the private sector. Um, and uh, we run the National uh, Forensic Video uh, Lab at the University of Indianapolis. Uh, and through that program, we've trained about 3,000 video analysts. And they adhere to the same standards. In your profession and in your experience, have you been called as a witness in court both on by a police officer to perhaps be called by his attorney, and have you both also been called, as you are in this case, by a prosecutor's office who may be prosecuting a police officer? Yes. Have you ever been hired by a, either a police officer to look at information for him or a prosecutor's office or someone pursuing a case uh, to look at information for them and come back with a report uh, that is unfavorable to them? Yes. Is it? What percentage of the time, if you can say, are you actually called to a court to testify on behalf of a police officer? Uh, I don't keep records on specific numbers. Um, my work is sort of divided, uh, half criminal, half civil, and of that um, division, 
I work equally, you know, for the uh, prosecution or for the defense or for plaintiffs and defendants in civil cases. Uh, both of those would involve uh, police officers either through the criminal process or through the civil process. It would be a small percentage of the work that I do, maybe five, ten percent. Are you familiar with body-worn cameras? Yes. And specifically the Axon body-worn cameras? Yes. How do they work? How does this, in specific in this case, I know you're looking at the Axon body camera, how does that actually work? Uh, the, all the body-worn cameras are, are, are basically have specific functions, uh, specific uh, minimum standards, and, and uh, the vast majority of them uh, are, they, they're on the body somewhere, usually on the chest. They continually record. So although even most police officers think that the systems are not recording all the time, they think they're just recording when they hit the button, it's actually recording all the time. So when the button is hit, they have what's called a pre-event record. The department can establish whether it goes back 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or a longer period of time based on the software. So with the Axon camera, um, it's standard set up for about a 30 second pre-record. We can't get that pre-recorded information if it wasn't already in the record mode. So in most cases, when the camera is taken out of the uh, charger, put on the body, it starts to record. If something were to happen to the officer, he was ambushed or something, that event would be captured. So if they recover that, we get the event, we can then uh, go into the, uh, into the drive, the hard drive, and recover the entire day of activity for that officer. So it's always recording. When the officer pushes the event recorder to cause the event to be recorded, they'll get about 30 seconds up until the time when they decide to stop recording then they initiate the end record. The device internally then says that clip, that video clip from beginning to end, will then be pushed off to a certain part of the hard drive, which is then uploaded or, or recovered in some other fashion. The old data is just recorded over once the drive gets full and is replaced by new information. But there is legacy data, um, usually for about eight to 10 hours on the system. The Axon camera can record for about 14 hours. It's a longer, longer system. And in this case, we gave you copies of three different body cameras. Is that correct? Officer yes. Kidd, Officer Linden Schmidt, and Officer Tenzin. Yes. And did you take uh, items from all of those cameras? Actually, I think it was only Officer Kidd and Officer Tenzing that you used to create some exhibits that would help you explain to the jury your findings in this case? Yes. Was the video recovered from Officer Tenzing's body camera, is that something that you think is reliable and accurately recorded what was going on that day? Yes. What, what do you do in your work? I mean, do you just play the video over and over, or what type of things do you do to help you prepare your presentation for the jury? Uh, every uh, digital video analysis case starts as an authentication case want to validate that this is the original data that was recorded in the first instance, that it hasn't been altered or changed. We then go through an analysis uh, to look at the timing from image to image, especially in cases where timing is an issue. If, for instance, uh, the camera captured the speeding vehicle and there was a crash and we wanted to know how fast that vehicle was going, the refresh rates, which means the number of images per second, and the timing between those images is variable on these body-worn cameras, not all of them, but, but many of them, including this one. So we often refer to digital video in real-time mode as being something that provides images at about 30 images per second, or 29.97 technically. That's real-time. Um, the, uh, the actual timing between images, if it were not variable, would be even at 33 thousandths of a second. That's 33 milliseconds between images. But we often find there's variability from 30 milliseconds to 40 milliseconds or in that area. So when timing is an issue, we go into the metadata of the file, that's the data about data, to discover the timing from each image to the next image in order to accurately answer the questions that were posed in this case. Also, um, to accommodate the requirements of this industry, the in-car video or the body-worn video manufacturers provide a wide view for the for the camera so that it gives a good perspective certainly not the perspective that a person would have a police officer 
uh, you know, we can see beyond 180 or 80 degrees. We can just see peripherally, just behind our eyes. That's why our eyes are kind of outset from our heads. But the body-worn cameras um, have normally what's called a fisheye lens that gives a wider view than a normal um, uh, camera lens would give to give better perspective. That causes a little bit of distortion on the outside, causes the shape of objects on the outside of the lens to be distorted and, and um, uh, not appear correctly. And the distance that, that an object moves when it's on the edges will be foreshortened, will appear a little bit less of a distance in motion. So that has to be corrected um, to assist the trier of fact in accurately understanding what's occurring from image to image. So we go through all of that process to, to um, develop exhibits that are reliable for the court. And in this particular case, we asked you to prepare a presentation that would assist the jury in making a determination as to the uh, timing between the movement of the vehicle, the movement of Officer Tensing, any movements of Mr. DeBose, and the timing of the shot that was fired in this case. Is that correct? That's right. And did you break down the footage from that body worn camera into a pretty much a frame by frame presentation? Yes. Mark and Shay was the mark for identification purposes of State's exhibit from the point. Yes. What is that? Um, this is a, a thumb drive that contains all of uh, the work product that I have to, to show the court today. And I made this this morning. And I believe you already loaded that onto your laptop? <clears throat> yes, I actually created this from the content on my laptop. Okay. So I have an exact copy on my laptop. And if you could uh, go to your frame by frame, that's the wide angle distortion correction, I believe you have it ready. Let's start with that. So this is a PDF document that contains the consecutive images with observations and annotations on the, uh, on the screen. And it says wide angle lens distortion correction, is that correct? Correct. Go to the next slide. This is the first slide you actually have. That this is where you started on the body camera to do your work, is that correct? Um, I examined everything up to this point, but this is the time period uh, of, um, that describe the events uh, uh, that are relevant uh, to my examination. And is there any one scared there or any other? Okay. Okay, you can see that, Mr. Burns. So at the bottom of each slide is a number um, for the record. And slide number two is just the very first image that we see. The outside edges here are the um, correction for the lens distortion. So slide three, I'm just pointing to uh, the fisheye lens correction. And these edges here are actually part of the image that when the image is corrected, it forces the image to lay flat and out and open. And therefore, we're now looking at a more correct uh, shape of objects. Um, at the top left-hand side, it says image 5633. That's the 5633 image in the video sequence that was recorded to the body-worn camera. And this is uh, at the top right-hand corner, I have a time. It's three minutes, 10 seconds, and 384 milliseconds into the video. So from the time the, the video started with Officer Tenzing seeing the vehicle go by, that would be zero minutes, and now we're at three minutes and three seconds. Correct. The, this is captioned fish eye lens Correction, is that the same as the wide angle lens correction? It is. If you could proceed. And then slide four just describes the image number, slide five, the linear elapsed time from the beginning. Uh, and then I'm moving forward from slide to slide. Uh, at slide seven, I note at 310, uh, 550 milliseconds, uh, we see uh, Tensing's uh, right hand on top of the car. And the jury is going to have uh, the opportunity to review this themselves when they are the jury and they're going to have a laptop. I would not know how to advance and go back on frame. So how would they do that on a laptop? This is a PDF document, and it, it's open by double-clicking. And hold the control key and hit the L key. It will make it go full screen. And the escape key will take it out of full screen mode. It's always helpful to go full screen at that point use the right and left arrow keys on your keyboard to go back and forth. Okay. Proceed. Thank you. Um, slide eight, uh, there's a vehicle that is uh, coming, and I refer to it as the unknown vehicle, um, uh, moving toward uh, Tensing. 
that vehicle uh, does move by the car, which we will uh, look at a little bit later on, but I wanted to note that this is uh, the first image where that, that vehicle is seen and it becomes relevant uh, a little bit further on. I'm going to move forward now. Every time I hit the button, I'm advancing approximately 29 to 34 milliseconds in, so in time. Thirty-four milliseconds. And as I move forward now, um, at slide eleven, uh, Tenzing's hand is visible. It would have been sort of shrewd in the fish eye and not visible. Um, it's visible coming in on the left hand side, moving toward the door handle. I'll go forward. On slide 31, at 311 and 309 milliseconds, uh, Tenzing begins to pull the door handle open. Where are most of the ways his hands going to As the door begins to open, shown on slide 47, uh, Mr. Deposa's hands, his left hand is visible. Uh, um, beside the driver's door, his right hand is just coming off the steering wheel. door begins to open in the next subsequent images. Um, at slide 56, I note that DeBose's right hand moves toward the ignition as his left hand moves up toward the door. And then on slide 72 at 312, 701 milliseconds, um, uh, DeBose begins to pull the door closed. And Mr. Fredericks, I know as we go through this, these are pretty clear images, and then some of the images will be pretty blurry, is that correct? Some images will become blurry, yes. What caused that, or what would cause that? It's referred to as motion blur. It's when the camera begins to move quickly, and the um, because of the nature of the sampling of the images, when the movement is so fast, the movement becomes blurred. Just like if you've got a regular camera, you take a picture of the jerk, and the jerk. Precisely. Yes. I'll go forward as the door begins to close. <coughs> um, on slide 100 at 313 and 679 milliseconds, uh, DuBose moves his right hand uh, into the area of the uh, ignition. And then at 314 and 267 milliseconds, uh, we hear the, uh, the first sound of the vehicle ignition start to turn on. Uh, this is the image. The audio, we hear that at 314 and 304 milliseconds. So inside the camera, the video and the audio are actually recorded as two separate streams, and they have a s different start point. So the audio, we hear the audio, <coughs> 304, we have the image that closely resembles it at 267 milliseconds of that second. They're very, very close in timing, but the audio is a consistent linear event that is always recording. The, the video are pictures, so they're not, they're, they're in sync, but uh, there's a relationship, a close relationship between them. And I know sometimes when you're watching a show um, on TV, you'll see, it's out of whack. Somebody may be talking and it's, you know, their voice, they're not quite doing a half a second later. Is that the case here, or is this, you can rely on when you hear something, the image you're seeing is in sync and consistent? Yes, this, this is in sync. It's just that they're recorded separately, synchronized together. The audio, we have more, more record because it's a continuous frequency. We don't lose anything. The video, we have samples every 33 milliseconds, which is how television works. I'll go forward now. Um, on slide 122, uh, we see tensing moving, beginning to move toward the vehicle, and you'll see the, the vehicle become closer to the camera. And we don't see his hand at this point, but then we in a few slides and we see his hand still moving. Uh, his right hand, correct. Yeah. Yes, we'll see the right hand in a moment. So as he's moving toward the police vehicle, 
turns his body, um, which causes the right hand, or he's, where his right hand is, the right hand part of the, of the scene, uh, becomes visible. Um, because the camera is, is not, you know, he's not doing this with the camera, the camera's affixed to his body, when he turns to his left, the scene will change. When he turns to his right, the scene will change. So he's moved toward the car, turned slightly to his right, and now we can see the hand. The next slide, I believe, is the last time we see Officer McKenzie's hand in the roof there. Correct. So on slide 131, I've added another annotation to assist the questions I was asked was, how long is it from these events until the moment the shot was fired? So at the top in red, I've timed this to from this moment as uh, Tensi's hand begins to move, his right hand begins to move downward. The shot fired will happen in two seconds and 397 milliseconds. So just over two and a third seconds. Continue. On slide 133, uh, Tensing reaches forward with his left hand toward the interior of the vehicle. It's at uh, 2.3 seconds from the shooting. Um, at slide 134, uh, I'm pointing out uh, Tensing's left foot uh, at the bottom left-hand corner of the image. It shows that uh, where he is standing, it gives you an opportunity to observe the distance he is from the car door at this point to show that his foot's not underneath the car door, that he's not in contact with the car door at this point. Can you also see a reflection in the car? Yes, so I'm pointing uh, on the side of the car, um, just under uh, Dubose left pointer finger, this dark area is the reflection of DuBose's pants. Tensing's pants. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Tensing's pants. Thank you. Go forward. Slide 138, I've stopped it at 2.13 seconds before the shot is fired. Um, uh, Tensing's left hand is in front of the steering wheel as opposed to behind the steering wheel, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, he's reaching forward to an area in front of the steering wheel. Uh, and I notice in the background, through the passenger side window, you can see the driveway across the street and the car in the driveway, is correct? Yes, the car in the driveway, yes. Does that become a significant also in your analysis? It does. Yes. Um, at 139, DeBose's left hand moves upward um, and into the vehicle from where it was, it was on the door. <coughs> at 2.1 seconds before the shots fire. Uh, slide, 141. slide 141, I'm uh, pointing to the full reflection of Officer Tensing's lower body uh, against the door of the car um, as uh, DuBose's uh, hand moves upward and um, uh, Officer Tensing's hand, the left hand is reaching in uh, in front of the steering wheel, and we are 2.038 seconds from the shot being fired. Continue. This uh, slide 143 shows a lot of blur. That's the motion blur we just discussed. That means that the camera is moving rapidly at this point. Slide 146, the motion of the camera stops. We can see that the SUV in the driveway in the background, the position of the fence uh, is as it was uh, a few seconds earlier. So the background hasn't changed. That means that the vehicle has not moved forward. Um, so the vehicle at this point, the Honda driven by Mr. DeBose, has not moved. It's in the same position as it was at the initial stop, and it's the same position as it was a few seconds before this image at 315, 245. Less than two seconds the shot Correct, 1.875 seconds before the shot. <coughs> I'll go forward. We can see, I'll just go backwards to two images. We can see as I go forward, although we get motion blur, the position of the SUV and the fence stay in the same position. It doesn't move, therefore the object in the background is staying in the same position in relation to the foreground that means that the vehicle is not in motion at this time. That slide there is 149. 149. 
Do you still see the reflection of Officer Tenzing's legs at the side of the photo? Yes, Officer Tenzing's legs are at the bottom left and center of the bottom of the image, reflecting against the car door. Uh, again, at 150, I know the reflection, the position of his legs, and this is 1.744 seconds before the shots fired. And Mr. Furnish, I believe for the next 20 or so slides, you're going to have uh, a number of those having to be towards the rear of the vehicle, is that correct? Yes. What would cause that? Um, so the question is, what would cause the, the camera to move from its perspective looking at the driver's door to looking toward the rear of the car. Um, I noted earlier that Officer Tensing brings his right hand down. We'll see his gun uh, appear in, in the camera view in a moment. The process of reaching forward and with his left hand, reaching back to, to uh, remove his service weapon, causes the body to turn. Which I that, that's total Response? His opinion is an expert. I'll allow, in that regard, to in his opinion, what went on as an expert. Would you could proceed with this one? Yes. So as the body turns to the right, it's the only way that the camera perspective could change to the right, we get the view of the back of the car. Um, what's important is that the camera level doesn't go down. It's staying at the same level, so we're not having, um, he's not going down to the ground, he's staying at relative depth level. And again, in the background there, you still see the vehicle across the street. Yes, the vehicle is in blur, but I'm pointing to the vehicle at the top left, and we can still see the fence position um, to its right with a bit of green on the side. And what does that indicate to you? That the vehicle has not yet moved. And we are now at 1.5817 for the shot. That's correct. Go forward. Next image, 156, where we have um, a little bit less blur. I've identified the same location where the vehicle is and the fence. Again, the vehicle's not <coughs> moved. The vehicle's not moved, and we are 1.548 seconds from the shot. Uh, as I go forward at 157, um, Tensing's uh, left hand uh, is still in front of the, the steering wheel, and I'm pointing to his left hand at the end of the arrow. You can see his thumb and his fingers here, Thumb and fingers of his open left hand, yes. And we're at uh, 1.516 seconds to the shot. I'll go forward. Again, we still have the, the fence and the vehicle. The background's still the same. The vehicle's not moved forward at 1.48 seconds before the shot. Um, as we move forward uh, to the next subsequent images, um, at 165, uh, Tenzing's left hand uh, has moved toward the seat belt and is in the area of uh, Dubot's chest and the, the cross chest seat belt at um, one and a quarter seconds before the shot's fired. next image at 166 is the first image uh, of the barrel of the gun coming into view of the camera. And so because the camera is on the chest, the gun would be positioned at about chest height uh, coming into the picture. Um, this is 1.222 seconds before the shot's fired. The last time that we saw Tensing's right hand was 1.17 seconds. So it took just over a second for the right hand to move down out of the view and for the gun to appear. So it fits very fast. And the barrel of the gun is what you're indicating is on the right here coming up point of view. That's correct. The gun appears further in the image as it moves into the car. Um, we see uh, DeBose's left arms move upward as the gun comes in, so his left arm is moving up at slide 168 at 1.15 seconds before the shot's fired. Um, as we move uh, forward to 1.124 seconds, we see Tensing's left hand uh, has moved forward toward the seat belt at 
on slide 169. We'll see the car in the background. The fence still hasn't changed in perspective at this point. If I go forward, this image at 170, slide 170, 1.092 seconds before the shots fired, we see uh, Officer Tenzing's uh, left uniform, um, uh, shirt uniform on his left arm, and then his whole arm, we have full perspective from his shoulder uh, down to the end of his hand. And we capture that, another image of his left arm on Officer Kidd's body Yes. So this is the image we just looked at, image 5800 in the sequence, and I've extracted it from the video um, as it was. Uh, when I examined Officer Kidd's video at 3 minutes 34 seconds, 0.268 milliseconds, um, Officer uh, Tenzing holds his arm out in front, and it is just to, to show the perspective of where the shirt starts and ends. We can see where the shoulder, all the way down to just above the, the elbow, and then the full arm from the elbow <coughs> to the hand. So what this shows from his body-worn camera is that we have full continuity perspective of the arm from the shoulder to the tip of the hand, and we can see that that it's not constrained by anything. He's got, um, we can see the full hand. Next slide. So that was that uh, image 5800, slide 117. I'll move forward now. Um, slide 171, again, although we have motion blur, we can see the fence, the SUV in the background, and the, in the uh, um, parking area and the vehicle has not moved forward and this is 1.059 seconds before the shots fired the vehicle is not in motion at this time well the very next one you can see it's not in motion but um, I would say this one or the next one is not in motion after that uh, the camera moves position, and then we don't have another view at it for about 800 milliseconds. So we're just a, a hair over one second to the shot being fired. Correct. And the car is not moving. Correct. The car is not moving. That's right. Proceed. So I'm moving forward through the images through 172 uh, as the gun um, becomes more visible. And moving forward, at image uh, 5805, slide 175, um, we hear in the audio, this is the picture, but the audio timing is at 316 and 224 milliseconds. We hear uh, Tenzing yell, stop. Um, I don't have any opinions of what he's yelling stop about, but there's a statement of stop at that point and we're at 928 milliseconds before the shot's fired. Continue. <coughs> the gun is coming up. Uh, Tenzing's left arm is uh, at DeBose's chest uh, at 178, at 816 milliseconds before the shot's fired. And I'm moving forward through the slides. Uh, at slide 186, image 5816, uh, Tenzing's uh, left hand is in contact with the seat belt. His hand's closed around the seat belt at half a second before the shot's fired. Uh, Dubose's left hand is, is in the air, and his right hand is forward. We'll see in a moment that he's got his hand on the steering wheel, his right hand. Um, at slide 193, we're 276 milliseconds, thousands of a second before the shot's fired. The gun is pointed toward DuBose's head. Um, the officer has his uh, hand on the seatbelt, the chest. Again, we have DuBose with his left hand up above his head, right hand on the steering wheel, and the SUV is still in the background. 
There's no perceived motion of the vehicle at this point, but because his head and hand are in the way, we can't see exactly where the, uh, the, the fence post would be, but the vehicle appears to be in roughly the same position. This is uh, less than three tenths of a second before the shot being fired? Correct. As I go forward, uh, again, uh, uh, to 243 seconds before, we see head, um, his head and hand in the air is blocking the view, um, and we have motion blur here. So it's possible that there's some slight movement, but I can't tell at this point. When you say slight, what are we talking about? Almost imperceivable movement forward by the Honda. I know that there is movement forward in a moment, at this point, I can't tell whether it started at this point or starts at the next moment. Um, we're moving forward to slide 195, 211 milliseconds uh, further ahead. And then at 196, slide 196, this is image 5826. The time of the shot fired is 178 milliseconds. And there is slight movement forward that I can detect in the image, although it appears the vehicle hasn't moved because the background's still the same. The relationship between the, the back wheel uh, and the, 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 pardon, the front wheel of the SUV and the back wheel of the SUV has changed slightly. There's a little bit less light in there, so the angle has changed, which means there's very likely some forward motion. Um, the other uh, thing that, that I can see here is the position of, um, there's an air freshener that is uh, uh, on the uh, rear view mirror. And in earlier images, which I can go to. Would that be uh, 146? Sure, if I can go to that. Sure. When the vehicle is not in motion, the camera is relatively parallel. Uh, the air freshener, you can see the bottom of the air freshener is not perpendicular with what's called the A post. This is the uh, post between the passenger door and the windshield. The bottom of the air freshener is more on an angle in relation to the A, A post angle. So if I go back to 196, we see now the bottom of the air freshener, even though the camera angle has moved, the relationship of the angle at the bottom of the air freshener and the A post has changed. In other words, the air freshener has, has moved. It's moved backwards, and I'm doing kind of an angle. Um, and the reason it would move backwards is because there's some forward momentum from the car. So at this point, this is the first image that I can see at 178 milliseconds before the shot fired that there's now forward motion from the car. And earlier you had said uh there was a slide, the last slide, you could say for sure the car was not moving, and this is the first slide you can say for sure the car is moving. Yes. In between, you're not sure when that moving began. That's correct, but this is the first visual indication that there's motion. There might have been motion a few milliseconds earlier, but for sure there is motion now. Okay, proceed please. Moving forward through the slides. At 198, 113 milliseconds before the shot's fired, uh, DuBose's left hand um, is moving downward. Uh, and he's moving away uh, from the gun uh, at 80 milliseconds before the shot's fired on slide 199. Slide, one, uh, slide 200, we're at 48 milliseconds. Uh, slide 201, um, the shot fired is 15 milliseconds, according to the audio. This is, this is the last image uh, uh, before the shot's fired. So the shot's fired between this image and the next image, but the audio tells us that the shot occurs in about 15 milliseconds from this position. We see the SUV still in the background. Um, so the forward motion of the car would have been very short, very s small. It, it had about 40 some milliseconds between when we know it's moving forward to this point and the background hasn't changed very much. And that's 43 or 40 thousandths of a second. Where are you trying to do that? Less than one tenth of a second, less than two tenths of a second, or not even that? 
Yes, we're, well, we're at, we're, we're uh, that's correct, less than two and a half a second. Um, so the, the shot fired would be fractionally about, about 18 milliseconds before this image. So what, at this point, um, the shot has already been fired. Um, and we can see the next images that um, uh, DeBose's left arm uh, falls uh, to downward. Um, and from this moment on, we then have the vehicle moving forward. Where is the body of the officer? Well, the, the, I have an image. Can I can show that. that. This is a, an image from uh, Officer Kidd's uh, body worn video at 4.49 and 472 milliseconds. It shows uh, tensing uh, after the shooting when the car had stopped. Uh, his body worn video is at the center of his chest, um, at some distance below his eyes. So the top of his head is maybe a foot and a half, two feet um, above the camera? Well, the, the camera is just over four inches high. Um, and so if we were to count up, it would be about a, about a foot and a half, okay. roughly. If we, were, if we were to count the pixels, it would be roughly a foot and a half distance between the lens of the camera and his eyes. Can you go back to the last slide again? Um, this is the, uh, the slide here, um, still on this uh, exhibit, um, slide three. So we're kind of thinking with our eyes here, but actually what is being filmed is being filmed down here. Correct. So the perspective of the camera is here. The camera can't see that area unless the camera is located um, just at about the center of the window. That's the only reason we have this perspective. And because it's located on his chest, then at the time of the shooting, the camera is located about the center of the window, obviously. Um, the officer's eyes would be about a foot and a half higher than that. And are you, did you also review the uh, statement of Officer Kenson? Yes. And I know at one point uh, on page 27, line 4, he said the following, I pulled my gun out and as I'm falling, I'm kind of, believe, the I'm below the plane of his, his window, so the only shot I could see to stop the threat was a head shot. Based on your analysis of this and your view of where the camera was, is there any way Officer Kenson's body camera could have captured that image if he was, as he said he was in the statement, below the plane of the window? No, there's no possibility that his head could be underneath the camera. Uh, if the camera were, if his head were at the level of the window, and the camera would be facing the very close to the door of the car, and we would just have a, a dark, dark door shot. The camera is clearly at the center of the window at that point. Okay, if you could go back to the uh, other program and proceed. Um, so moving forward from slide 202, uh, we, we now have forward movement of the car. We can see on slide 205, at 317 and 236 milliseconds after the shooting, we now have a perspective that shows the car has moved forward um, a few feet. Uh, I, I can't measure how many, um, not very far, but this provides an opportunity to have a perspective of how far the car may have moved forward after the shot was fired. Um, as uh, um, <coughs> Both his head goes backwards. Um, we have forward motion of the car. We can see a little bit of the uh, blur of the air freshener that's now on even a steeper angle, which indicates the car is moving at a faster movement forward um, as uh, both head is back uh, after the shooting. I'll move forward here. Uh, we see that uh, Tenzing's hand is holding onto the seatbelt or in the area of the seatbelt. Um, his hand begins to remove from the seatbelt, moves toward the uh, door. Um, at this point, slide 213, 
we can see the perspective of the camera, which is get, which is now going downward. So um, several milliseconds after the shooting is fired, the camera then moves from that position, the center of the window, down downward, and we begin to see more of the side of the car as tensing goes downward uh, in perspective. So as I move forward, we can see um, his hand, Tensing's hand, uh, on the um, uh, door area and B post of the, the driver's door. We can begin now to see the side of the driver's door <coughs> in the right in the immediate foreground. And I believe now we can see the vehicle that was across the street that we used to be able to see in the front window and now in the rear window. Correct. It's visible through the rear window, yes. And the indication the vehicle is continuing Yes. And these are, this is a good indication to show uh, when the vehicle does move forward, what the background looks like. So we can now see from all measures that there is forward motion at this point. And I'll move forward uh, as we move down. As, as his perspective moves down, we can see the side of the car. Uh, at slide 225, uh, there is a movement in the back, and this is Officer Kidd getting out of the passenger side of uh, the police SUV that's in the, in the back here. Um, we can see him uh, getting out of his vehicle. And I'll move forward at slide 226. Um, uh, Tensing releases his hold uh, on the, the car. Uh, his hold in the car is released at 17.9 seconds. I'll just go back and at first contact the car at 17.4 seconds. So he was holding on to the car for about a half a second. Uh, when he released, he goes, this is the perspective at slide 228, the side of the car door. So this perspective here would be where the camera is against the, very close to against the car door. At this point, his head would be about a foot and a half higher than this, um, which may have given him a perspective where he would be able to see over top of the door into the car. Um, this image here at 229 is basically looking straight up. So he is going down to his back. The camera is facing uh, into the air. The wide angle of it you know, pulls things in so it gives the perspective you know, that he's quite close to the car. Um, at slide 232, we see both of his feet um, in the view of the camera. So he's now on the ground uh, with his feet up. So he'd be, he'd, his back would be on the ground. As we move forward, the car um, begins to drive out of the picture. This uh, image at 238 is looking up at Tenzing's face because the camera obviously has flipped upwards because of the motion of his body. Um, the camera has a little bit of flexibility and it's just tilted up toward his face. And as it does that, uh, we see a vehicle that is in motion on the opposite side of the street, uh, moving, um, uh, the perspective we had originally when we first started, and I pointed out a car that was coming down the roadway. This is just a few seconds after that event car has now arrived at his location, so as he's going down onto the ground, the car is driving by him. Do you have another couple images of that? Yes. So I'm just, I'm just playing the video. Let's go backwards for a moment and take us back to where he works. So this is the vehicle in the background on the, this exhibit is called Vehicle Question. And we see the vehicle going by as he begins to get oriented straight up and down again. Um, the vehicle uh, tail lights, brake lights are on. The vehicle uh, is, uh, is, is slowing down, pulling over to the side. Um, this is the opposite side of the street where uh, there's a barricade opposite to the SUV that was parked on this side of the street. 
and then we see his perspective as he begins to uh, get off the ground. Um, Dubois, uh, Dubois' vehicle is in the distance uh, over here, the, and there's a via, another vehicle that was parked uh, uh, on the street earlier. Um, this distance is exaggerated a little bit because of the wide angle of the camera. Things that are further away appear much further away than they are in reality. It's sort of like looking in your rear view mirror or your side view mirror in your car. There's a sign that says vehicles may be closer than they actually are. They look further away because that, that camera, that uh, mirror is designed to see a wider view. So this isn't really as far as it, it is. And is that the last slide on that particular? Yes. Uh, I that yes, out. it is. There's been some testimony in the courtroom about people hearing sounds that transpired at the time this took place. Could you, I think I asked you to make a clip of but just a few seconds when uh, Officer Tensing is starting to open the door until after the car takes off, is that correct? Yes. Could you play that clip for the jury? So uh, I believe the last time you say the car has not moved for sure, that you can say for a fact, was it, I believe, image 5801, uh, it would be at 3 hours and 16 minutes, or 3 minutes point 16 point 061, is that correct? Yes. And it was 1.059 seconds before the shot was fired. Yes. Then I also ask you to make an audio clip, or a clip that captures that amount of time that would be the longest amount of time the car would have been moving before the shot was fired? Yes. Could you play that for me? <coughs> so you can say for sure the car definitely was not moving when that sound starts and takes you up to the moment the shot was fired? Yes. Just okay. fractionally over a second. Play the other <coughs> Mr. Fredericks, based on your review of all of this, do you have an opinion to a reasonable scientific certainty as to the position of Ray Tenzing in relationship to the vehicle of Sam DuBose when the car was fired? When, I'm sorry, when the shot was fired? Yes. What is that opinion? Um, that he was standing uh, um, erect, that the camera was positioned at the center of the uh, window, that his head is about a foot and a half higher than the camera, and that uh, he was not in contact with the side of the car. And do you also have an opinion to a reasonable scientific certainty at the time of the shot, had the car moved? Can you repeat that, please? At the time the shot was fired, had the car of Mr. Lowe's moved? At the time the shot was fired, the car had, my opinion, was moving forward for about a second in a bit, yes. And how far had the car moved? The perspective shows that the movement forward would have been no more than a couple of feet. And you also have an opinion, at the time of the shooting, had Officer Tenzing been dragged at all by that vehicle? No, he had not been. Another question for this one, Very good. Charles? Mr. Fredericks, you indicated that you had been hired by the prosecutor's office, correct? Yes, sir. Hired by, the term hired, I assume you've been paid by the prosecutors, correct? Yes. How much have you been paid? Uh, I don't know. I don't do the accounting. 
Um, I don't know. Well, can you give us a ballpark thing? It would be a guess. Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, I think you're guessing about a lot of stuff on this video, so guess about how much you're being paid. The, the comment will be stricken. The objection is sustained. Go ahead and re-ask the question. Mr. Fredericks, let me try to narrow this down. Is it $5,000? I'll try to explain how uh, it works in my office. Um, we have a retainer. Uh, in this case, because it's a government agency, we don't ask for a retainer up front. We build to a fee schedule. When exhibits come into my office, um, I have part of my staff, my technicians, who uh, in, do an intake. Mr. Fredericks, all I want to know is, is $5,000 a reasonable ballpark thing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, Likely, with the work that was done, the meetings I've had, uh, it's probably more than that. But I and the, the travel, it's going to be more than that. I've been here for two days, so um, you know it'll be probably more than five thousand. I don't know where it was going to be. It's going to be more than ten thousand, do you think? Uh, it would just be a guess, Your Honor. I don't know. Sir, uh, have you ever been to Cincinnati before? I have. And when was the last time? My recollection, maybe 10 years ago. Have you been here in connection with this case other than the last two days? No. Uh, did you ever, you've never been out to Rice and, and Valencia or Rice and Phil Street, correct? No. no. I assume you weren't there on July 19th, 2015? No. I assume that you did not observe this incident with your own eyes? No. I'm, I'm correct in my assumption, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Fredericks, the, you made a conclusion that, and I, I think one thing I'm taking for certain from your report, or from your testimony here, is that the Sam DeBose car was in motion at the time the shot was fired. Is that correct? Yes. And your testimony is that it was in motion for at least one second for a little more than one second before the shot was fired, correct? No. I said 800 milliseconds. Okay, 800 milliseconds is what, eight-tenths of a second? Correct. So just slightly less than a second? Yes, sir. And that's your opinion? Yes. The, you've just spent about, I, don't, I wasn't timing it, but I'm going to say a half hour giving your presentation. Does that sound accurate? About 45 minutes. Okay, good. You're better than I am at keeping time. How about the entire length of this incident? How long did that take that you've just described? From your from your slide number one through whatever your last slide was, 200 and something. Appears to be about eight and a half seconds. Eight and a half seconds. And how about from the time when Sam DeBose pulled the door shut and started the car until the shot was fired? How long did that take? under four seconds. Did you ever, in the course of your investigation, review Officer Lyndon Schmidt's body camera video? Yes. And in that video, did you see Officer Tenzing picking himself up off of the street <coughs> on Rice Street? Yes. And were you able to determine how far that, was, that point was from the point where Officer Tenzing was at DeBose's side window? I didn't measure it, no. Could you have? Not without going to the scene and doing measurements, no. 
Would you agree with me that it was some distance removed from the, the, dis the point where Officer Tenzing's body ended up on the pavement from where he was at the side window of office, or Mr. DeBose's car was some, some distance. Would you agree with that? Well, it depends on the definition of some distance. If you were to suggest it was a, probably a car length, I would say it could be. Okay, and a car length is how long? Uh, 17 feet. Thank you. You used the term very small forward motion and slight forward motion in your description. Can you define those terms? Yes. The, the image that I showed um, and suggested that it was uh, an opportunity to, for you to perceive the, the, the movement forward, um, my estimate uh, would be because it was relatively imperceivable, but there was forward motion, that it would have been a couple of feet but I invited the jury to assess it for themselves. Okay. And, and you would agree with me that ultimately the jury has to make up their own minds about what this video shows. Is that a fair statement on my part? I agree with that, yes. When you were a Vancouver police officer, did you ever work on the streets? Yes. Did you ever reach into a vehicle? Never. And were you ever um, assaulted by anybody? Oh, yes. And that all happened in a split second, did it not? Correct. And you weren't wearing body cameras then, I would no. assume. That's been a few years ago? It has, yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the car, that the DuBose car moved forward in your presentation. By, you said a couple feet? Um, from, in the, approximately 800 milliseconds from when it was not in motion to when there was movement by the air freshener indicating forward motion and possibly a perceived movement based on what's happening in the background. Um, I would think that in that 800 milliseconds, one to two feet would be reasonable. I, I wouldn't disagree that the vehicle moved forward about that far. Okay, so now we're from two feet to maybe one to two feet. No, I believe my testimony was, uh, you know, a couple of feet, one to two feet. Um, there, there is movement forward. Can't say exactly how much it is, but it would be very minimal. And there also had to be movement to the left. Is that correct? Of the vehicle. At that point, uh, I don't know if there was any movement to the left. Uh, it wouldn't be measurable uh, in the images. Um, the, the, the position of uh, DuBose's hand, right hand, on the steering wheel um, didn't appear, like there's no sudden movement to the left. It was still in the same position at the point of the shot fired. After the shot was fired, um, you know, the vehicle goes out of view. So it it, we know it moved to the left because it was on the other side of the street after the shot was fired. Well, we know that there was a, a silver car parked on the same side of the road a few feet in front of DeBose's vehicle, right? I wouldn't agree with a few feet. I think it was some distance in front, yes. As, as um, the, uh, Tenzing gets off the ground, spins around, that vehicle is still further down the roadway. Well, then... But we know from the video that there was no contact between DuBose's vehicle and the, sil and the car parked on the same side of the street, correct? Um, I don't have any information about that. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. So somehow that car had to go left to get around the parked car, correct? Yes. And we saw in the video, or in your presentation, DeBose's right hand on the steering wheel. Correct. Before the shot was fired. Right, and it, the, the position of his hand didn't move, so it didn't, the steering wheel did not move to the left um, at, at the point of the shot being fired. After that, I can't say what happened to the steering wheel. At, at the very beginning of your presentation, the first image you put up there is a picture, go back to that if you don't mind, to number two. <laughs> you can see here, slide two, the distance 
that the other car was. You said a few feet. It's a little bit more than a few feet. This gives the jury an opportunity to evaluate that distance. Okay, and, and it also gives the jury an opportunity to notice the uh, left front tire of DeBose's car, correct? Yes. And that is that wheel is pointed straight ahead. Is that a fair statement on my part? Uh, I, from this image, I don't think we could say whether there is, it's not slightly turned to the left or pointed straight ahead. I, I wouldn't have an opinion of, from this image alone. I'd have to look at other images. Could you do that? <coughs> I'm not going to have an opinion on whether it's turned a bit to the left or straight forward, but this gives the jury the opportunity to look to assess it for themselves. Fair enough. From Tenzing's body camera video there also, in that picture that's up there right now, his body camera video is looking down on the roof of the car. Is that a fair statement? Uh, back there as he's approaching? Yes. Yes. I mean, his... his uh, his chest area would be about the height of the vehicle. Yes. Okay. Can you jump forward to your slide number two on your program? Yes. yes. And right there, obviously the body camera is viewing downward toward the, the car. Correct. Okay. Do you know, or are you qualified to say how far a car must move or how fast it must move before somebody whose arm is inside of it uh, is thrown off balance and begins to fall? No. I believe you testified that it was 0.881 milliseconds that the car was in motion, correct? Correct. Would you term that a split second? Yes. Could you go forward to number 141, please? see Tenzing's left arm reaching into the vehicle, correct? Yes. And DeBose's left arm is reaching up apparently toward Tenzing. <coughs> His arm is moving upward. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't have an opinion whether it's moving toward him, but DuBose's arm is moving mm -hmm. upward. Can you move a couple slides forward? Where are we at? One, 144. Okay, and the camera is moving rapidly at that point, is that correct? That's correct. And it's your opinion that that's, that rapid movement is because Tenzing's body is moving or the car is moving? No, the car is not in motion. The camera is in motion. It's called motion blur caused by the camera, not the object. And how, how fast does the body have to be moving to cause that motion blur? Not, not very fast. Um, the, the motion blur is caused because the camera is sampling the light information. It's called a charge coupled device that's inside the camera. It samples the light. The sampling occurs over a period of fractions of a second, so milliseconds. Um, if the 
if the shutter, in essence, is open, capturing that light information while the body is in motion, then the, the movement is going to appear blurred because the light is being captured over a period of time. So that's called motion blur. It's caused by the movement of the camera. Doesn't, the, the motion doesn't have to be very fast to have some blur to it. Okay, well, in this slide right here, it appears that Tenzing's body is no longer by the B post. Would that be a fair statement on my part? The, the B post is here. Um, this is the lock, the door lock. The B post is here. Uh, he's close, I mean, he's in the middle of the window. Um, the A post is just out of view, and the B post is just on the edge of view. Is that his right arm there? This is his left arm. Left arm? Yes. And where is the rest of his body? Uh, his body would be just outside the car door. Just opposite of Mr. DeBose, correct? Yes. Could you go forward to number 149, please? Again, I'm not an expert such as yourself, but it appears to me that uh, Mr. Tenzing's body is lower at that point. Is that a fair statement? What we can say from this image is that the camera perspective is pointed downward. Um, the location in the car, uh, if, if, he's, if the officer is bent forward, we're going to have this perspective, or if he's lowered, we're going to have this perspective. So one or the other. The or how about if he's falling? Uh, well, if he were falling, he'd be moving away from the vehicle. Um, at this point here, uh, as it go forward, we can see that his feet are in well, the same let's position. Stop. Let's go. Well, let's, let's look at his foot there, if we can. Yes, sir. Right there. It, is, it appears to me that his right foot is coming, lifting up at that point. Is that is that fair on my part? I don't know if I would agree with that, I, and I wouldn't disagree that there's some motion by his foot here. Um, he's in the same the same position. The car we know has not moved forward. Now, whether tensing is moving back and forth slightly, that's possible. He is some distance from the car because we have enough light to cause this reflection. And this is just, as I move forward here, um, we can see that the car is not moving, and then we have the, the gun come in to view. What is Mr. DeBose, I don't mean to interrupt you, but what is Mr. DeBose doing in the sequence leading up to this? Uh, he has started the car engine. He's leaning forward, it appears? Uh, du DuBose is leaning forward here slightly, yes. And the left hand now appears to be on the steering wheel? I don't see his hand, we don't see the steering wheel at this point. Can you see Tenzing in there? I'm sorry? Can you see Tenzing's left arm in there? Yes. And where is DeBose's left arm with reference to Tenzing's left arm? Uh, Tenzing's left arm is over top, DeBose is underneath. And you can't see DeBose's hand, correct? Correct. Do you have an image in there where DeBose's left arm is over the top of Tenzing's left arm? <coughs> oh, you're beyond it at that point. Yeah, no, not not until then. This would, this position here is the only time that. Tenzing's arm at 179 is higher than, uh, pardon me, that DeBose's left arm is higher than Tenzing's, but his arm is in the air and it stays in the air. Um, so there weren't any images prior to this that show the other way. Would you agree with me that at that point Tenzing's body camera is not looking through the car but rather looking toward the rear? Yes. So he has been spun around, either voluntarily or involuntarily. No, I, uh, that's a loaded question in terms spun around. All we can say is that he's moved his body such that the camera position moves. Okay, his body has been rotated, has that? Yes, the camera perspective has been moved because the body, his body has, for whatever reason, 
has changed position, yes. You don't know whether that's because Tenzing voluntarily turned or he was somehow forced to turn? Well, I, I can't see a force here well, that would have been applied. This is within the time range that the car was in motion, is it not? Uh, no, the car would have been starting to be in motion at about this point when the body is, his body is already turned. So the, the okay. motion, let me try to answer your question carefully. If, um, if the force were going left to right from our perspective, so if the, cor if the vehicle were going backward, then he would be turned the way we see it. If the vehicle is going forward and he's in contact with the vehicle, his body would be turned toward the vehicle. This is, ha this is the opposite effect. So, well, what if the, the vehicle is turning left into him at the same time that it's going forward? Well, first of all, we know that's not the case at this moment because, the, because we're 800 milliseconds from the shooting. But if the vehicle were going forward and into him, he would be, if he were attached, holding on for some reason, he would turn into the car. If the car were going backward, he'd be turned this way. So we're looking at opposing forces here. So if you're asking what force caused him to turn outward, if he were moving with the car, of course, you're going this way. If, you're go if the car is going backwards, it's taking you this way. And, and as I'm, for the record, I'm opening my body up like the camera shows. If the car goes backwards, close my body into the vehicle if the vehicle's going forward. Well, let's add another factor in there. What if his arm was pinned in that car? Well, we know it's not pinned because we can see it's completely free and clear. Well, that, and that's your opinion, correct? Correct. You weren't there? Correct. Are you able to tell from the video that the Rice Street, to go southbound on Rice Street, which is the direction the Bose's car was faced, was an uphill grade? Would you agree with that? Uh, I wasn't out at the scene. You can't tell from your video analysis whether the street is level, downhill, or uphill? No. <coughs> but yet you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, the jury exactly when the shot was fired and where Tenzing was, what he was doing, correct? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you, there, there's one image on there that uh, about the time the shot is fired, can you find that on there? Yes, stop right there. Can you tell anything about the position of, well, first of all, Tenzing's left hand at that point is holding the seat belt, correct? Yes. And his right hand with the gun in it, it appears that his forearm is on an upward angle, correct? With the wrist cocked down just slightly. No. The, the forearm is at the, coming out of the position, the side of the camera. Um, the, the camera perspective shows that at about the center of the lens is the center of his arm. So as I'm holding my arm directly in front of, of where my chest is, the camera shows clearly that the forearm is at about, the gun is at the height of the camera. His forearm comes out from the middle of the camera perspective. If it were above, it would be on top of the video or off to the side. It's at the center. Okay, we know that the, uh, we know that the camera moved as Tenzing fell, correct? Correct. You don't know whether the camera is moving at that point, do you? Yes, I do. There would be motion blur if the camera were moving. Camera, there's no blur in this image, so the camera is static. It's affixed to his chest. Uh, Officer Kidd's video that occurs within seconds of this shows the camera is still affixed to his chest. OK. 
okay. My eyes aren't apparently that good because that looks pretty blurry to me. Yeah, there's, there's I no, also there's, noted there's that no, image. Yeah, sorry, uh, there's no motion blur in this image. Okay. Mr. Fredericks, I also noted in that image and subsequent images that the camera appears to show the, the bottom of the roof of the car rather than the top as we saw at the very beginning. Uh, in the interior. The interior roof. Can you explain how that would happen if Officer Tenzing is standing straight up, as you indicated? Uh, the officer is closer in the window. He's reaching into the window with the gun. He's closer in. As a result of that, the wide-angle lens is capturing the, the, the inner side of the car and more of the interior. If we were to back up out of the vehicle, you would see less of the interior and more of the outside of the vehicle. So I assume it's your, your opinion that Officer Tenzing couldn't possibly have been falling, going down at that point. Yes. Correct. And again, that's your opinion. Correct. Can you explain to me and the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why somebody would yell, stop, stop, if something's already <coughs> stopped? The rule will allow it if you can answer it. The speculation. If you, I just said if you could answer it, that's fine. I, when I testified uh, earlier in, in direct evidence and I noted stop, I said I don't know why uh, he yelled stop. Um, there could be a few reasons why. It would be pure speculation. I don't feel comfortable giving that. Sure, you don't. Uh, Do close yeah. the argument yeah. Agree, agree, agree. Let's keep it to questioning, not commentary. Mr. Fredericks, would would one of the would one reason to yell stop, stop be because the car was in motion? If he can answer it, I'll uh, the objections of the That would certainly be one reason that would make sense. Yes. Thank you. Now, there was one image on your, your presentation where you showed Officer Kenzing's feet after, by the rear wheel of the car. Can you find that on there? That would be, I think, 232, perhaps. Correct. Okay. Um, are you able to say, well, I would assume with his feet where they are, the rest of his body is up alongside of the car. Would that be a fair statement? Well, we saw his hand. As the camera does go down, his hand comes over to the uh, top of the car by the B post behind the driver's head area. He holds it there for about a half a second. The car is in motion. As he releases his hand, the camera shows he does go down to the ground. And then we see this image which clearly shows he's on his back with his feet um, uh, uh, in front of him as the car is moving past. So at, at some point, the car is moving forward. He's holding on to it at, after the shot's fired. Um, the holding on the, and the car moving forward um, and him going to the ground occurs after the shot's fired. Whether he's in contact with the car, alongside the car, as you said, I don't know. He's beside the car. And you can't say how far from the car he is or how close he is. Uh, he's very close to the car. We have a wide-angle uh, lens, so we're seeing the bottom part of the vehicle. It's very close to the camera. Um, I, I would say he's, he's probably within inches or within a foot at the most from the car. Almost being run over by that car, correct? Um, I'd say it, at, at at this point, he is, you know, obviously he's not run over. The car goes by him. Um, I wouldn't want to be this close and on the ground to a car, uh, but um, he's very close to the vehicle, yes. Okay, now at one point in your presentation, you showed an image, I, mean, I think slightly past there, where, where the camera is looking up right there at, at Officer Tenzing's face. Obviously, the camera moved to correct. get that image, correct? Yes, it did. So you can't say when you showed the position of the camera as shown on Officer Kidd's video at a place on his chest, you can't say that's precisely where it was when all these images were filmed. 
Yeah, I, I, there? I can because the camera is fixed with a special clip that goes through the shirt, and if if the camera moves, it would fall off the body. The fact that it's there means it's still in touch in contact with the clip. <coughs> the camera position <coughs> is consistent with how the officer, what we see when he first approached the car, it's at the same height approximately. Um, and it's in the same, it's where an officer would wear that, it's where all the other officers are wearing it. So the image from Officer Kidd's camera is perfectly consistent with the camera having not been moved. Okay. When, did, as part of your investigation, did you examine the camera itself? No. So you, you can't tell, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, whether it was functioning properly on July 19th? Yes, I can. Uh, the, the metadata in the file, the video, uh, provides all the correct information, the relationship to what's called the compression um, a group of pictures, called a GOP, how the structure of the compression worked, um, the timing relationship between images, the number of images per second, it was all functioning properly. Including when he turned it on, we had the 30 second pre-record, then audio started. So yeah, it was all functioning properly. No question in your mind the car was in motion when the shot was fired, correct? Correct. No question in your mind that Officer Kensing ended up farther down the street and to the left from after he disengaged from the car from where he started out, is that correct? Further down the street. I don't know about, well, to the left because uh, um, the other officer's camera, when it starts to record, Tensing is getting off the ground. He's about in the middle of the road. That's Officer Lyndon Schmidt's camera. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, just a moment, Jeff. Thank you.
Skip Kennedy. on the car. Did you did you obtain some measurements of the car that we were talking about? The actual about? car, yes. Okay, now. And they coincided with the uh, manufacturer specs. Okay. So there was actual measurement of the car we were yes. uh, asking to have recreated. And then that you confirmed that by doing what? What did you do? To by going to the uh, manufacturer's website. Okay. And that would include uh, various heights and, and uh, distances, how tall to say the, the uh, the uh, bottom of the... Would it be a, the overall specifications, the height and the length? Okay. What did you do once you had those uh, specifications? I obtained a photo of the car. Okay. Um, now, were you talking about the actual car, or did you go no, out and no, photograph it? No, a, a car just like it, a 1998 Honda Accord. So you found that exact make, model, and your car, that color? Yes. And you took a photo? Yes. What did you do then? I gave it to a um, sign company up in Westwood, and they created the um, full-size model that you have in front of you. That's the, the item right here in front of the jury? Yes, that's correct. <coughs> Just let, let the record reflect that Mr. Kenny has identified the model you have here as marked as States Exhibit Number 17 as the model he helped to create. Very good, director. Thanks, sir. That's all the questions I have. No, sir, it's not. That's taken from a photograph of a different automobile, but the same model and make and year.